Dogman versus Yeti Dogman. Dear Scary Stories NYC, I'm extremely excited to bring you this story of not one, but two different kinds of Minnesota Dogmen. I didn't even know that there were Dogmen in Minnesota, but I guess I shouldn't be surprised because it is just to the west of Wisconsin and it's in the Great Lakes region. In fact, the story I'm going to tell you took place just to the west of Lake Superior at a relatively tiny lake called Osier. My friend Will called Johnny when camping at Osier Lake in Isabella, Minnesota with his 13-year-old son, and the two of them almost didn't get out. That was because their escape route was cut off by a savage battle between two entirely different looking dogmen. I've been extremely interested in Dogman since I was a kid, but this is the first time I ever had anyone come up and tell me their actual story about Dogman. I've never had a chance to attend any sort of convention, and I work too many hours to travel around much. So, Dogman never had a chance to become a hobby of mine, at least not until now. Johnny doesn't want to come out with his story publicly, so he told it to me, and he's allowing me to tell it to you. Of course, the first thing I asked the two of them, even before they told me one single detail, was if they had gotten a photo or a video. I'm intensely interested in seeing what exactly these things look like in real life, so it's no surprise that's where I went to first. But Johnny had left his cell phone in his tent, and his son isn't allowed to bring his cell out of his home, except when his mother wants him to. He has a transponder beacon on him when he's camping, and he and Johnny carry walkie-talkies with them whenever they get separated. A bit old school, but I'm not going to judge how someone else chooses to raise their kid. Anyway, the short version is they did not get photos, and if you listen to the story as it plays out, you'll probably understand why that was. Now, when I was the age of Johnny's son, I wanted nothing more than to see a Bigfoot. This kid got to see not one, but two large, hairy forest cryptids, and I wanted to know how he felt about that. I was sort of surprised when he shrunk up while considering his answer. In fact, it took him a long time to say anything at all. He seemed confused by what I was asking him. I had just presumed that he would be as excited as I imagine I would be. But the cold hard fact was, this poor kid had been truly and deeply frightened by this situation that he and his father had endured. He was not a fan of cryptids. He was not a fan of monsters. He was just a kid who came face to face with his own mortality when these two cryptids cut him and his dad off from their route to safety. I think that's enough preliminary table setting time for me to bring on the main course, which is a story that I really wish had happened to me. So, Johnny and his son were camping over at Osier Lake, like I said, but their tent and camp were set back from the lake in the woods. The two got hungry from setting up camp and had a somewhat early dinner. Then, they walked over to the lake and found a private little spot on the beach to hang out. It was a beautiful sunset. Johnny planned on enjoying it until it was done, then returning to camp and making a fire for toasting marshmallows. There were rocks sticking up out of the water near the shore and so the two of them pretended they were looking at lake monsters sticking their heads above the water. It was fun to pretend they were just a few feet away from real monsters. They were soon to find out that sometimes, imagining something is better than the real thing. First, according to Johnny, a terrible stench filled the area. Not low tide, some other strange deathly odor of rot. When Johnny got to this part of the story, his son looked sick and asked if he could go to his room and play video games. Johnny said yes, and we were alone for the rest of his retelling. Now I sent you a link to a 360 degree image of the little beach this all happened at. Please show that during this part of the story so that people can understand the logistics of what happened. Johnny and his son were out on that little isolated patch of sand. They were unable to move very deep into the thick vegetation on either side, but the two main directions they could go would be either swimming into the lake or else back through the trees to the area where they had set up camp. Since neither of them enjoys swimming, that really meant only one route. 
the way back. So behind them, something fell out of the dense woods onto the path leading back from the beach. Turning to see what it was, Johnny said he gasped because he thought he was looking at a polar bear. Granted, Minnesota can get cold, but there are no polar bears here outside of zoos and circuses. So Johnny was up on his feet, feeling like he was losing his mind or dreaming. When the polar bear got to its feet, Johnny said he could see that it wasn't a bear at all, but the largest dog in the world. It was the size of a bear, at least according to Johnny, and his son began crying. Johnny said he covered his son's mouth and carried him off to the side of the clearing, hoping that the immense white bear-sized dog would not notice their presence. The polar dog, for lack of a better term, had dark black eyes that exhibited eye shine when he stood in shadow. Johnny said that it was getting dark by that point, and he was forcing himself to stay calm for the sake of his son. The white dog got up on all fours and danced in a panicked circle, as if he had lost his sense of direction. Johnny prayed that he would run away from himself and his son and not out onto the beach with them. Before the yellowy white canine could go anywhere though, another beast loudly crashed out of the woods and into the pathway back to camp. This one was dark in color, sort of a grayish black, but with a kind of kerchief of white fur under its neck. I don't want to call them black dog man and white dog man, obviously, and the white one was not an albino, it had black eyes. So I'm going to call them dog man and polar dog man, even though I'm not actually implying that the white one was from further north at all. I think it probably was from a litter of dogs of various colors. I don't think it was from a separate species to the polar dog man. I do think they were from different tribes or clans, however, as this did not seem to be a play battle. The two of them seemed to be fighting for keeps, and I imagine the winner would gain more turf to hunt on and seek mates on. This is all supposition on the part of Johnny and me, though, obviously. So the gray dogman stood up on its hind legs while the polar dogman seemed to prefer an ordinary dog stance down on all fours. Since the big gray dogman began harassing and attacking the polar dogman, Johnny said he saw both of them stand up and battle using their front paws as weapons. Now, according to Johnny, this was not like the way bears stand up on their hind legs. These two both seemed to be seeking a height advantage, and they seemed as comfortable up in the air like that as they were down on the ground. He repeated that part over and over to me because he seemed most amazed by it. They were as comfortable standing up bipedally as being quadrupedal. They could move like animals or they could move like men. It didn't matter how many times I told Johnny I understood what he was saying. He would insist that I couldn't possibly understand because I hadn't seen it with my own eyes. Then with an odd expression on his face, he would tell me all over again about how these two predatory beasts would walk the same way that you and I walk. His mind just could not believe what his eyes had witnessed. It seemed to have completely changed his worldview, judging by the way he was acting about it. So, in terms of the animal fight, Johnny said it was clear that the gray one with the white on his neck was the aggressor. The polar dogman howled and yipped and generally had a worried expression on his face. The gray one leaped on him, and such terrible noises and sights occurred that Johnny said he pulled his son back into the trees and prevented him from looking any further. But something happened in those few seconds of doing that before Johnny could look back out there again. Something happened where the gray dog man just went too far. He somehow awakened something inside that polar dog man who let out an exclamation of fury and indignation that could be understood by anyone or anything in hearing distance. That dog man had gone one step too far and he had triggered the polar dogman into an absolute explosion. Chunks of gray and white fur flew, and now it was the polar dogman who had become the aggressor. Johnny said he'd never seen two such great beasts trying to end each other's lives like that before. 
It was like an untamed nature film times 12. There were teeth snapping and claws clawing. It was hard to look at, but there was nothing else Johnny could do. He prayed that the fight would take itself elsewhere, but then his worst fear happened. The fight rolled out onto the beach. Both creatures rolled over and under each other, tearing and hitting and snapping. The big gray one was able to break free and he made a move that seemed to surprise the polar dogman as much as it surprised Johnny. The huge dark dogman ran out into the lake and began swimming for the other side. The polar dogman looked utterly confused by this behavior and he tentatively and uncomfortably waded out into the water dropping to all fours and beginning a doggy paddle after the gray dogman who had a far more human swimming style. The gray one reached the other side of the lake first and skedaddled into the woods while the polar dogman was still midway through swimming through the lake. Johnny took his weeping traumatized boy, packed up quickly, and they both went home. So if people tell you that we don't have dogman in Minnesota, you can tell them this story. Not only do we have Dogman, but we seem to have multiple kinds of Dogman. That, to me, is the big takeaway from the story of... <coughs> dogman versus Yeti Dogman. Mary Gillies, consider the lilies, they toil not, yet they are so. Mary Gillies, consider the lilies. She's our executive producer, you know. Please join us in thanking today's executive producer, Mary Gillies, for making this episode possible. Mary receives lots of our perks, including our recently released four and a half hour volume five of our secret uncensored Dogman Story Archive. That's now over 25 hours of Dogman stories, all far too wild to ever tell on this channel. Access to our archives is available to anyone who joins our channel or our PayPal club at $3 a month or above. Now here's international TV spokesmongrel Henry Lee Dogman to fill in the rest of the deeds. Hank. Thanks for watching till the end. If you liked what you saw, please consider clicking like on the video or sharing it with your friends and family that you think might also be interested. If you would like to see more of our work, please consider subscribing and hitting that bell icon next to the subscribe button so that YouTube will alert you when we put out a new video. To become a channel member and gain access to our special perks, you can click that join link under each of our videos. Another option is to join our PayPal Subscribers Club at PeterBernard.com. You can join for as little as 99 cents on YouTube or a buck 50 at PeterBernard.com and that gains you access to our weekly secret uncensored episodes. If you'd like to see our 21 hours of archives of uncensored Dogman stories, then please join at the $3 level or above. To get to watch our shows in advance of the public, please join at our $10 level. That gets you all the perks. If you join our channel memberships, you need to check our community page here on YouTube in order to get the links to the secret videos and other perks. If you're in the PayPal Subscribers Club, Peter will email you all the news and links himself. Once joining the PayPal Club, which is Peter's homemade club, please give him a chance to see that you've joined and to compose you a personal welcome email as none of that is automated. But whichever you join, We'll name you an executive producer for the next available episode. Do you have a scary experience that you'd like to share with us? You can email us at scarystoriesnyc at gmail.com or call our Scary Stories voicemail hotline at 804 Le Scary. That's 804 537 2279. It's a Google voicemail box, so that means it keeps cutting off after every three minutes. If your story is longer than that, please keep calling back and we can piece it together on our end. Good night and have a scary tomorrow.
back for more scary stories.